Welcome, everybody, to Who's Your Band? I am joined today by my co-host, Mr. Sean Morton. How are you, Sean? I'm not good, Jeffrey. Oh, why not? not good. It's a Sunday morning. It's a Sunday folks. morning, That's- number one. I just woke up. I came back from a gig last night. I had to work with this really shitty comic. I can't stand working with this. I wasn't comic. there. No, you're a good comic. <laughs> oh, okay. a shitty comic. And then he decides to wear a fucking backwards baseball hat like he's like 17 and, and he's playing on the Sandlot movie. <laughs> Give it up, Jeffrey. You're old. Stop it. <laughs> Stop hanging on to that little grasp of youth that you think is left enough. You're old. We get it. Turn your hat around. You don't think I, this makes me look younger? No. You know what else I'm doesn't like, make you look younger? Your face. Your face doesn't like, make you look younger either. I'm like one of the kids. Oh, yeah. Are, yeah? yeah? Okay. In Cocoon. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, <laughs> I think I think in real life I'm actually older than Wilfred Brimley was in Cocoon. He was like 42 years old when he shot that movie. There, no, was, there was a no, meme. There was a meme that came out. It was Wilfred Brimley and it was Paul Rudd. It was it was Paul Rudd because he was 51, and it said Paul Rudd is the exact same age that Wilfred Brimley was when he made Cocoon. Wilfred Brimley looked the same when he was a teenager than the day he died. That's Nothing true. changed on this guy. That's true. But speaking of people, with him, I took a picture of him once and I held up a picture, a little poster that said diabetes on it. <laughs> with Wilford Brimley? Yeah. Well, hold on. So before we bring in our guest, how did you meet Wilford Brimley? At a convention, like a chiller theater convention. Ah, okay. <laughs> speaking of, of, of people who look old and, uh, but, but aren't old. <laughs> Boy, this is the intro I need. All right. Yes. <laughs> that, that golden <laughs> voice. You could hear him on 101.5 FM in New Jersey. He is a comedian. He is a DJ. He's a music aficionado. Give it up for our guest this week, Mr. Steve Travelese. How are you, Steve? I'm good. Is there like an applause track you play under this now or something? Yeah, we may put it in post. Uh, you know. By the way, I play a lot younger than I look. <laughs> so, so did you know? Talking about Wilford Brimley, when Sherman Hemsley did the Jeffersons, he was 35. Wow, really? Yes, when he, he was George old. Jefferson. That's a, yeah, that's a he, hard life, though. That's a hard life or a bad hairline, one of the two. He did, uh, I did. I did the last show he ever did. He did it at my club in Cherry Hill. Mm-hmm. And uh, back in, like, what was it, 2013, he died at 73. So he was, like, 35 when he was doing all that. Do you remember when I did your club and I fell through the stage? Everybody remembers that. <laughs> I brought that up. I, said, I got Sean Morton coming on this week. Oh, he's the guy that fell through the stage. It's sarcasm. God, that was what oh, Steve, Steve, no. Steve ex- tell people the story of Sean falling through a stage. Oh, dude, it was so great. I can tell it. I, I could tell yeah, it better. Right, you I, he knows yeah, what he actually he did. <laughs> so the stages were weird. Like it was kind of like, it looked like almost little folding tables that were like put together. Right. Ew. And the leg just gave out. I had just did a joke that said, that I had lost a hundred pounds, right? And as I say the joke about losing a hundred pounds, I fucking fall. The leg gives out, and I go ass over feet, and then I jump back up. You can hear a pin drop, right? Everybody's like, "Oh God, this guy's dead!" And then I jump back on stage, and all I could say was, "Guess I should lose another hundred pounds, huh?" And I got the room back, but it was that the was most beautiful. embarrassing That's things funny. ever. Oh, speaking of of Wilfred Brimley. Steve, you would know because you this know gonna be the show, the Wilfred Brimley episode. Or no, 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 and no, it's not even Wilfred Brimley now. I want to talk about it's, uh, Hensley. You know a lot of trivia. We both done your show. We have to do trivia on the show. Was uh, Wilf, trivia. was a uh, hmm? trivia? Yeah. <laughs> okay, was um, <laughs> yeah. Sherman Hemsley was was, was yes. he a, was he a homosexual? No, not at all. Nothing I know of. I don't know. Maybe he was. I did not hear. I had heard he was a homosexual. I've heard that too. I have no idea. Yeah, I've heard that too, actually. Hmm. Was he married, Steve? I didn't really get to know him that well. You I just mean, booked I the fucking him. guy, like, Jeff. You didn't have him over for dinner for Christ's no, sake. No, no, really. We did a show together. You know what's funny about the show, though? He had uh, he grew up in Philadelphia. So he had always wanted to uh, do a show for his neighborhood. And I get this call uh, that Sherman Hemsley wants to do a show. I own at the time sarcasm in the Cherry Hill Crown Plaza, which was the old rascals. Mm -hmm. So we bring him in, figuring that Sherman's going to go up there and tell jokes and be George Jefferson. 
but he doesn't. What he does, he goes up there in a red velvet jacket and he sings 11 Frank Sinatra songs. Sinatra, Dean Martin, like the whole Rat Pack stuff. Hmm. He goes up there singing to tracks. And this is the show he always wanted to do. So uh, I, I did. Com- I opened it with comedy. I had another guy doing comedy. And what we did was we actually had clips of Jefferson's in between, you know, because that was the funny. Because Sherman was singing. He was going to sing the songs. And uh, that was his, you know, that was his classic thing. Is what he wanted to do. And then when he, he died. He live. He, huh? he sang to the tracks. But he, he was up on stage with a mic singing songs. Okay. Okay. And when, when he died. Say- mm. Good. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, when you said he's singing to the tracks, I thought he was kind of like lip syncing, like it was already recorded. Oh, no, 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 no. The, the, the tracks were instrumental. He was, yeah. Right. Uh, we never abandoned. But then when he died, I get a call from Channel 6 in Philadelphia saying that, you know, Sherman did his last show at your club. We'd like to talk to you. So at the time, I was working at WIP during the day. I leave there at 6 and drive up to 101.5 to do 7 o'clock. So I said, look, I'm on my way to Trenton. Okay, we'll meet you in Trenton. I'm like, you will? So I get there. And at the time, Governor Christie's doing Ask the Governor at 7 o'clock. So I had till 8 o'clock. And Christie's walking out with the News 12 crew behind him. And I'm walking in with the Channel 6 crew behind me doing the Sherman Hemsley bit. But he died at uh, 73. And it took a while for them to bury him. There was some kind of legal thing going on. But hmm. what a great guy. I mean, really forthcoming, really cool, easy to hang out with. I heard I heard good things about him. I heard he was he was a, a good guy off. But I also just heard he was a homosexual, but kind of had to keep it kind of under wraps. No, it's, have, it's very I, it's very important that I find this. Jeff is focusing it, it, on it this. It did not come up. Is this going to be the probing interview with this? No, he's no, he's focusing on this. He's trying he's trying to figure out when Sherman came out so Jeff can make his grand entrance out of the closet. Oh, oh, that's what he's coming out to. Yes, I want to know how he did it. <laughs> Do it on my show. This way you will get ratings. You know. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. When people find out Jeff Paul is coming out, that will be the gathering around the Best Buys to hear the show. And, and you know what you're going to hear from the from the New York, New Jersey comedy community? It's what about it? time. <laughs> Speak, what else speaking, of, speaking of your show, Steve, yes. tell people about your show. And and you have more than one show. You Don't you also do a sports show? I do uh, New Jersey 101.5, which is like, to me, the best radio station ever because... There's no other station like it. We get to push back. You know, we push back against government. We push back against uh, everything. Whatever we want to talk about, we have total freedom. And it's great because as a host, I can do politics for an hour. I can do music for an hour. I can do whatever is going on in Jersey. And Jersey is unlike any other state because the way this started, once upon a time, you know, people moved to Jersey out of New York out of Philadelphia. So it was always commuting back and forth. So whatever news you got, whatever weather you got, whatever traffic you got, it was like, okay, here's the traffic. All these New York roads are, by the way, the Jersey Turnpike is crowded. And that'd be it. So in 1990, this radio station comes on. And it was also during that time, like in the 70s and 80s, when people who moved down here or out here thought that they had, you know, they had an attitude. They were far superior to the Jersey people. They were from the city. And uh, usually a bunch of assholes, mostly. Uh, But what happened was uh, eventually they moved here. They settled here. They opened businesses here. So that cut to New York, that commute to New York wasn't as strong. So therefore, 1990 comes this radio station. They do a survey. What do you want more than anything else? Traffic and weather. All right, 24-7, we'll give you traffic and weather every 15 minutes. What do we talk about in between? Do we play music? On the weekends, yeah. But during the week, they come up with this idea to take what's going on in the news, provided it's Jersey, and throw it out to the, you know, talk about it, do Q&A, uh, take calls from, you know, listeners. And the first topic we ever did, who makes the best pizza in New Jersey, blows up the phones. So from there, it becomes a force in the market. And the other thing about Jersey, 101.5, or Jersey itself, what we have that no other state has is an attitude. You know, when you think about Jersey, you know, Jersey's all about attitude. We I'm, curse I'm more working with a co-host. Like that. <laughs> right. We cur- you, you know what the show's like. I mean, in, in New Jersey, in the, in the entire country, we utter more obscenities. So, I mean, it's just the way we are. And that attitude, along with everything else that we're doing, 
you know, that attitude along with the conversation is what gives us uh, the ratings and also the ability to uh, push back, you know, people, politicians and all, all they all know we're there. It's kind of like sports talk radio. I do WIP on Friday nights. The only giant fan in Philadelphia, diehard giant fan <laughs> out on the radio. I'm not going to lie about what my team is. I'm a giant fan. And I'm on the radio talking about the Giants like Tokyo Rose, your team sucks. <laughs> and and it, but I've been doing it for two, and I don't really do that. But I mean, you know, but it works. I've had the show for 13 years. But it's the attitude that makes the whole thing work. As you know, when you were in there. And yeah, I was, the I was station, it, I'm going to say the station is incredibly interactive between yeah. what you do online and, you know, the instantaneous phone calls that you get. And you guys really, it seems like, during election season, you guys really stir up the pot, especially in this this uh, past uh, election of uh, governor. I mean, you guys were all over the place and people were weighing in. It was incredible, uh, the feedback you guys got. Yeah, we could go, and that was the other thing. You know, I had Shitterelli on, I had Rizzo on. Um, we all did. You know, did you invite Murphy? Murphy? We invite him. He doesn't want to come. He, you know, when Chris Christie was governor, he did ask the governor. He came in once a month. Uh, as a matter of fact, the night of Hurricane Sandy, you know, Christie came in and we told him not to because he was down in Atlantic City. It was really bad. You could see it brewing all day long. He's like, no, I got to come in because it's the only place I can go to reach everybody. And I still get people thanking us. Hey, man, you guys got me through Sandy. But he would come in once a month. And then after that, uh, when Murphy got elected, he I and mean, Christie would take the hard questions. Christy wouldn't back down to anything. I got to let my dog in my room here. Christy uh, wouldn't back down to anything. And it wasn't a sugarcoating kind of thing. He came in to good times, bad times, whatever his approval ratings were. Chris Christie was- phone always, calls? He did. He took phone calls. He took phone calls. Wow. He would come in with a crew. He would take phone calls and whatever they needed him to do. Okay, so-and-so is going to give you a call tomorrow. So-and-so is going to give you a call tomorrow. And things got done for the individual listener. If you got through to Chris Christie on Ask the Governor, and from, from being with Christie before and after the show, he really was a good guy. He really cared and did for those people. Um, Murphy goes on 12, takes the softball questions, and that's it. You know, he's been invited to come on. He was on my show once talking about a snow emergency. But it's, it's, that's the difference. Chitarelli came on, answered anything. Uh, Rizzo, Rizzo listens to the show as did Chitarelli and they, as, you know, they would call in. Um, but it's that kind of thing where we, uh, we kind of like, I don't know, what can I say? You know, we, we try to keep them in check. We're not afraid to push back any place else. You hear the news, they come on with whatever they're going to say. Oh, okay. Uh, with us, what the hell is he talking about? How dare he? And when you listen to the topics that we do, we don't back away from anything. And that's what makes it work with, you know, with callers because you know, they get us. And where, you, where you're located, it seems like the signal reaches a, a good part of Jersey, if not the whole state. It does. It, uh, it comes mostly central Jersey, uh, North Jersey, not so much. And South, like South Jersey. But now we have an app. So because we have the app and radio is really moving toward the apps, right. you know, we get a phone you get us in your car you know a lot of now when you buy a new car the your phone apps will pop up on your dashboard that's right and it's great because now we're everywhere i mean we get calls from all over the country because people who've left new jersey still want to stay in touch and we're kind of that you know with that store you know the, when you go into the italian store to remind you when you were a kid and you smell the cheeses and everything and you love it mm -hmm. that's that's kind of the with the audio version of that yeah, that was the one thing that I really kind of caught my eye when I was on your show a couple of weeks ago. You're looking at the screen, you're seeing all the callers coming in. And like you had calls from like Ringwood, which is like the top of the state, down to like Wildwood, Cape May, Mullica Hill, Matawan. It's like the entire state is listening to the station, which is a great thing. Yeah, it's, it's you really feel like you're part of something. Yeah. You know, you really do. And you know, having you guys in there, you know, it's, it's great because, as you know, when we were all in there, there's a chemistry. There's a, it's kind of like a rat pack kind of thing where we all kind of mess around with each other. The audience and the audience has their own. It's kind of like how I would have the whack pack. I kind of have like a version of that with regular callers who are trained sure. from listen to bring material. 
maybe bad material, maybe right. goofy. I got a guy, Raymond, who opens up my game shows by singing a Sinatra song. Mm-hmm. He's 85 years right. old. He water skis during the day, but he this is his thing like all week long. He walks around town with his chest out. He's Raymond from Rockaway. And what do you think I'm going to sing Wednesday night? <laughs> he gets the That's people great. over. Up. And then after he sings, people will call in the rest of the hour. Oh, Raymond was so good. Oh, we love Raymond. He's going he's gonna to be like my music director. <laughs> and the show is actually like a fun hang. So people who are, and we get a big New York, New Jersey listenership here. So you guys, if you don't know uh, 101.5 uh, uh, FM and Steve's show, check out what hours are you on? Let people know that. 7 to 11, Monday through Thursday. It's, like I said, it's a great show. It's a great hang. Both Sean and I have been on it. That's another great thing about Steve. He'll put on a lot of comics. And uh, it's, imp- has- it's so important because, you know, we're, you know, I was listening to the Rogan podcast last night and he said something that just jumped out at me. He said, we're a tribe. Like there's outsiders, but like if he knows he, there's a comic, like he will just talk to them like a regular person. And that's so important with us because even last night we're at a gig and we're just hanging out and we're, and we're bullshitting during the gig. Other people don't understand what goes on in our minds. You're you know, right. Exactly. They, they, it, we're a different mindset and people just don't get it. And like, they, they think they do, but so that's why people like, I personally, I get that, that cold blooded feeling when after a show, somebody will say, Hey, I liked this joke that you did. Here's how I would have said it. <laughs> and this and that happened to me Friday. I was like, "Oh God, you gotta be fucking kidding me, right?" Like, I, and I got you gotta stand there, and you got like, "Oh, that's good, that's good, that's good." Now, if Jeff said, "Hey, you know, I, I like that new joke that you did. Here's an add-on. Here's a tag to it," I'd be like, "All right, perfect." You know what I mean? Like, I'll see if I can work with that. Like, you know, if you said it too, Steve, it's the same thing. But that whole it's the whole camaraderie thing of trying to keep our little community together by supporting each other, and it's a great thing. Sean, you played sports, right? Yeah. Okay. And how about you, Steve? Did you play sports? Yeah. Okay. So that's what it's kind of like, you know, it's like when you were on a team, you know, you had that camaraderie and it was like just the people in that locker room. Um, I think it's the same thing with comedy. It's just the people who are doing it, who you're on that show with, who, who, you, who you see night in and night out, weekend, you know, you, when you're doing like a, a shit show, you know, or you're doing a great club. You know, you, you, you know, you're, you're in it with them and like regular people just don't get that, don't understand what, you know, what, what this is, how in the same night, you know, I can do, I did, the, I remember when I did the Gramercy Theater with Voss, you know, sold out. And then the same night I go down to the village and do a show at the Grizzly Pair for 15 people. And it sucks, you know? Dude, I, that I, I said the same coming. thing. No one else gets that. <laughs> My first show ever was in front of 250 people at a competition. And I did, I placed second my first night ever. And then my second show I ever did was for three people in the back of a bar in Sea Caucus. That's, it's, it's, that's, it's a, it's a, it's a huge mind fuck that we continue to do to ourselves every single week. So we're right. assholes. We're just gluttons for punishment. No, but we, we also like, listen, when it goes great, and it goes great most nights, you know, you love it. And that's why it draws you in and, you know, you like that. And the thing with stand-up, it is instant gratification. And we like that instant gratification. You know, I mean, the crowd last night with, didn't like the instant gratification. Let's just get that out of the way. Like, we had to actually, you, you, we had to tell them to like laugh. You know what I mean? No, we didn't. They were, they were, they were fine. They, they, they were fine. Good, Steve. You got to get that sign behind you. You know what? What's great about comedy with comics is that, and you talk about the add-ons. I was um, the manager at Catch a Rising Star for five years and House MC. And comics will support other comics. It's like, you want to help a comic? Bring him jokes. And there were a lot of times when I went up there and I would, I was just cutting my teeth. And comics would say, yeah, that was good. Try it like this. Or try that. And suddenly they've been giving you material. And it's such a good thing. I opened Richard Jenny once and, um, at the Strand Theater. And I was a huge Richard Jenny fan. He's my favorite. And um, I got to hang with him afterwards. And we were talking about writing and everything. So stupid me, right? The kid in 2005. I'm like, hey, listen, Richard, you know, if you have an idea, I'd be happy to write for you. You know, send it. I'd be happy to send you stuff. And he's like, no, I would love that. But the problem is you may, you may think you heard it. You may have heard it in the second grade and don't realize it. You send it to me. I do it. I'm in a lawsuit. He said, 
my writers, I have, um, I have two guys that I trust. I know them. I take them on the road. We all work together. And this is, uh, this is what we do. Uh, and I said to him, well, can I give you one idea? He goes, all right, what's that? I said, you should do a best of album. Call it the Vigeni Monologues. It'll be perfect. Dad, he goes, that I may do. But, but it's that <laughs> idea. And, and, but he was so cool with, you know, just having a nice, you know, opening up and bringing you in on what he does. And there was a guy, Hal Spears, who was Richard's, he's a comic, one of Richard's best mm-hmm. friends. And, you know, you go into the store, supermarket, you come out with, you know, bread and milk. Uh, like Vic did, right? Uh, Richard goes in, he comes out with 15 minutes of, uh, you know, hysterical stand-up comedy. And that's the kind of thing. And the other thing I talked to him was, I was at a show with him once, and when I was bringing him on stage, and I'm hanging with him, he's like, go away, go away, I got to think. And he's like, we don't just pull this stuff out of our ass. This is before I get into, you know, we have to work this and hone it. And you're talking about like how comics think of stuff. There are so many levels that, we take an idea to try to make it funny. And every now and then you get lucky where that guy walks up to you in the club and says, yeah, I would have done it this way. And you're like, wow, it actually is funny. I didn't think of that. And then it's yours, right? Because he doesn't care. You mind if I use that? Well, go right ahead. So you're never you going to put your spin on it anyway. Yeah, you're going to put your spin on it anyway. Right. I've had so many times where like I've I've seen like friends of mine, like even the Vanessa we're working with. We worked with uh, Vanessa Hollingshead last night and I was, you know, I was talking with Jeff and like how we, um, she was doing her last special a couple of years ago. And I helped her like, you know, time out the special, put the, you know, the sequencing and, and her timing and stuff like that. There was jokes that I had written that had no room in my set. They were just one off jokes, like random shit. And like, you know, she did a bit and I was like, you know, I have this joke that I've never done on stage, put it in here and see how it works. And it was boom, instantly. It was a, it was a huge pop. It's a huge pop, the joke, which I love doing. I don't give, I don't give a shit. Like I help people write for roasts and, you know, things like that. You got to help each other out because we're all going to benefit. That's what's great about the comedy community. You know, we are, we're like a tribe. We do care about each other. You know, it's like a team and you, you know, you look out for each other. You do. do. Now, going back to your show, you also, you love talking music, right, Steve? I do. Okay. I absolutely do. And so, if we were to ask you who your band is, who would you say your band is? The Beatles. I'm going to show you something. Can you see this? Hold on. See this? Look at this. Here's my, here's my Abbey Road shirt. Ah, there you Abbey go. Road. You know what that is? They were so far ahead of their time that they invented social distancing. Who doesn't? <laughs> The thing that amazes me about the Beatles, and again, this is one of those bands that I grew up with listening to through, you know, my mother, my uncle and things like that is the, the catalog that they put together yes. in, in a short seven, amount of time. seven years, yeah. seven years. And it's not just the amount of songs, it's the change from the beginning when they're the pop band to this psychedelic, amazing, completely different genre of music. Which you want to hold the older to dig a pony? Yeah. Do you prefer the uh, older stuff or the or the uh, the latter stuff? You know what? Every day I prefer something different. What I love, uh, the one thing about the Beatles uh, is between 1964 and 1966, they did five five number one albums, three world tours, and two full length feature films. Think about that in two years. There's a book out called The Beatles Song by Song, Day by Day, Album by Album. And it goes, it chronologies from 1957 when they got together to 1971 when they broke up. Everything they did that day. And you'll see like in that time, woke up, filmed this scene from A Hard Day's Night, went to the studio, did these four songs, got uh, that night, played, you know, played France, played Paris. And that's what they were doing at that. That's why when they stopped in 1966, when they stopped touring, uh, it was August uh, in San Francisco. Candlestick Park was the last show. The van pulls up to unload the equipment. They tell them, you can't put it on the baseball field. Um, so they were like sick of it at that point. They'd done three, the three different world tours. They, uh, at the end of the tour, they're getting on the, they're on the plane. And Paul's sitting on the plane. He's got a seat next to him, empty. George is walking over. And the engineer's behind him. George says to Paul, did you get it? You know, did you record it? Paul looks to the engineer and he goes, did you get it? Engineer says, yeah, 
George collapses in the seat and goes, finally, I'm no longer a Beatle. At that point, they stopped touring. They let, think about this, they, they were so sick of touring after those three years that Sgt. Pepper, the White Album, Magical Mystery Tour, The Yellow Submarine, and Let It Be, uh, and Abbey Road, never got toured. Think of all the money they left on the table. They were so disgusted with touring. You got to see Ron Howard's Eight Days a Week that they said, you know what, we're going to, we're so sick of being Beatles. We're going to invent another band. And we're going to let Sgt. Pepper go out on the road. And they did it that way. But the way they would do it, they were so tight. They, they, if you got to you know, watch the, um, the anthology, they not only made great music, they changed the world. People look to them for how to dress, how to act, um, politics. They got involved in everything. Bands didn't do that. And they were the beginning of the rock and roll touring business. They were t- too big to play arenas. They had to play stadiums. And Do you think a lot of it is because there wasn't a lot of tremendous great music at that time that they just stood out that much? No, it's just the opposite. Go back, Sean, to 1964. Okay, in 19, in 19, well, first, let's start it this way. The end of the 50s, all the, they've been trying to kill rock and roll since its inception in 1955. The parents hated it. It was the devil's music. The, the, the religious leaders hated it. Get rid of it. By 1959, they almost did it. Buddy Holly dies. Chuck Berry is in jail. Uh, Jerry Lewis marries his cousin. Elvis is in the army. And from 1959 to 1963, you got all this parental approved, Frankie Avalon, you know. Uh, Bobby music. Rydell. Bobby Rydell. And oh then God. in 1963, Kennedy dies. And at that point, you know, 1960, you had the Rat Pack. That's how Sinatra and Dean Martin were able to squeeze in there. And well, hold on a second, Steve. Good. Leading up to that, okay? And when you talk about change in the, in the country, Ken, when Kennedy gets elected, he, right. he, you know, remember, he's the great, he's the great society, right? He's the okay. young hip leader. He's exactly. Because you go from this old guy in Eisenhower, right. okay, to now this young, handsome, you know, where they're picking out cool stuff. Hot wife. In, and the, right, they're bringing in pop stars to sing at the White House. So, don't you feel like the kind of the world is is changing as well, and it's changing, getting away from like we're wearing sh- uh, uh, shirts and ties and and khakis, and you know, it's it, you can see it's starting to, to change yeah. and become a little bit more rock and roll. And that's what happened. So now you get America in this new direction. You're spot on, Jeff. And you you what happens is he dies. America gets gut punched. Now we have no leader. We're rudderless. We got, we're back to the old guy, Lyndon Johnson. Now it's like, oh my God, what are we going to do? Here comes a plane from Liverpool in 1964 on February 7th, bringing four guys with four completely different personalities. Pick your poison. You love them all. And they're, and they are, you know, people wanted someone to love and here they come. But at the same time, not only do they come, Motown comes, British invasion comes, all the British bands come, soul hits. You got folk music is coming. So you got, if you couldn't put a song from last year, music changed so rapidly. Look at those four years. There's never been anything like it. From 1964 to 1967, you had British Invasion, you had Motown, you had Soul, you had folk all coming together. That and you're going to start to have psychedelic rock. Yeah, that, that was on the way in 1968. So you couldn't play a song from last year. It was so, the, the top 40 was so tight. Mm. Plus, all that other novelty stuff. Like now I listen to uh, my friend Dave Heffel does a show called uh, 60, uh, 60 Satellite Survey. And when you hear those songs, and we have the best of the best, now the cream of the crop. But when you hear those songs mixed in with all the other stuff that was on the top 40 at the time, you see how much they really stand out. So to answer your question, Sean, it wasn't they were the only thing. They were in, they were in the deepest music competition that ever happened in rock and roll. And back then, your generation gap, father and son did not listen to their own music, uh, to, to the same music. Like today, you know, you go back 30 years, we're still playing music from the 70s and 80s. Back then, you couldn't play music from last year. And that's why it changed so rapidly. So when you talk about the difference between I Want to Hold Your Hand, which, which was the first number one single in America, which revolutionized the country, everybody bought on, Please Please Me, they start Please Please Me, the first number one hit. By the, song, by the time that song ends, what gets me about that, the world would never be the same again. 
And there are very few songs that you could say made that happen. And then Sergeant Pepper comes out. They take a year off in 66. Everybody's like, oh, my God, they're done. What happened? Where are they now? They could never keep up. And they're like, you just wait. Sergeant Pepper comes out June 1st, 1967 and goes number one. It becomes like one of the greatest albums of all time, if not the greatest. No, I, so I it kind of makes me. sense to me now. Now that now that makes sense the way you described it, because now I kind of feel like it's kind of like that shift that I felt between like eighty nine to ninety two, right? When you right. had that huge hair metal scene, and then the one song the comes out, and then it completely changed the whole music dynamic. So now the it makes a little more sense to me. Yeah, yeah. exactly. The 80s but, roll, sex, <laughs> drugs, and rock and roll. The nineties, the party's over. Yeah. Be- well, well I, I think it, with the eighties. You know, and I hate, you know, because we've had a lot of these bands on on this show. And one thing that you're really impressed about is, you know, they get labeled hair bands and, you know, just kind of being all about fluff and image. But you don't realize how how great musicians these guys are and how they really study music at Berkeley and, 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 and just like they're really like the best, but it just kind of gets thrown out and tossed away and it's very dismissive. But to go back to what you were saying about that time period, um, yeah, th- th- you made some great points. And it just heightens to me the importance of a guy like Brian Wilson, okay? How he really kind of, he inspired the Beatles. I don't think a lot of people really inspired McCartney and Lennon. And when you hear the, the early Beach Boys stuff, where it's all about surfing and partying and, and having a great time to what Pet Sounds becomes, you know? Uh-huh. You know, that that really, I think that's the American version of the Beatles. Well, yeah, the Beach Boys um, were competition. As a matter of fact, when Brian Wilson was working on the Smile album, he was Sgt. Pepper and scrapped the project. It didn't come out for year till years later. The Beach Boys right. were a formula band. Do you think, and Brian Wilson never surfed, but he realized that surfing was the craze, right? It's always about surfing. Okay, what else did people well, like? Their father like, kind of steered him in that direction as well. His father was, yeah, his father was like, uh, his father was tyrants. They used to you know, take out his glass eye and make him look inside as punishment. It was Murray. I was do if I had a glass eye. Do that. But uh, <laughs> yeah. so uh, what happened was, you know, they would write about cars. They'd write about girls. They'd write about school. And the Beatles came in. There was an intense rivalry. And, but they respected each other's songwriting. Brian, if you if you do if you see the making of Pet Sounds, you know he hired a commercial jingle, a, a TV commercial writer, to help him write Pet Sounds. He writes Pet Sounds, one of the greatest albums of all time. Brings it to the Beach Boys, brings it to the label, and they're like, "What is this?" And they were so disgusted. Instead of releasing Pet Sounds, they released the greatest hits anthology. They had no idea what they had. And you know, even today, there's the constant documentaries on Brian Wilson. Mm-hmm. But Paul got Brian. As a matter of fact, Ronnie Spector tells the story how um, he wrote Don't Worry Baby. He heard Be My Baby. And he, and he wrote Don't Worry Baby off Be My Baby. But Brian, was a, he was a recluse and he was very much into sounds. He was one of the first guys to, he didn't want to tour anymore. So they had the, they had the budget, they had the money, they left him in the studio. And he was one of the first, and then the Beatles, to use the studio as the instrument. Look how much did he the also hire the Wrecking Crew to kind of like as the um, as, oh, yeah. as well, the, the uh, background musicians on it? They played for everybody. I interviewed Hal Blaine once for an hour, and he gave me his his resume that was like a book of all the songs he played on, which was amazing. You know, they played on everybody. The Tell monkeys, people who the Wrecking Crew was, Steve. The Wrecking Crew was the band who it was Hal Blaine, uh, Carol Kay. I can't remember who else was in it. Pete, he was a bass player. Right. Uh, she was, yeah, um, I'm trying to think. And Mrs. Maisel, uh, there's someone who's kind of like the Carol Kay character. But um, Pete Trabuco, I think it was, or something. I forget. But there was, they were the band that played in the studio on a lot of the rock acts. Like the, the kids would tour. And these were the guys, the serious musicians who played on the records. Like the monkeys got in a lot of trouble because, oh, the monkeys don't play their own instruments. Nobody played their own instruments. Then it's when they played on the Beach Boys. While the Beach Boys toured, it was the Wrecking Crew that did, that played on the albums. And Brian worked with the Wrecking Crew, got very close to Hal Blaine. And they came up with these sounds. 
uh, that were like Loop Vibrations, a perfect example, which bands never did at the time. And it took rock and roll to the next level. And Brian Wilson was a genius. And, and Paul knew it. You know, they knew that they would compete with Brian Wilson. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. At, you know, like the Stones, like they didn't worry too much about the Stones because the Beatles came out with an album six months later, the Stones came out with an album. Uh, but they Stones were friends. They stayed an R&B rock band. The Beatles yeah. and Beach Boys, I think, evolved their sound considerably. Yeah, the Stones, that's what you're right. They stayed R&B. The Beatles saw themselves more like... I don't know, Rogers and Hammerstein, they were writing for the ages. You know, that was Paul's thing. You listen to I'm the I'm so Beatles. glad you said that because I consider McCartney and Lennon to be the Mozart and Beethoven of, of the past uh, millennium. Yeah, and that music will stay, all the music will stay forever. That is the most crossover. You know, you look at that catalog and just how, how yeah. varied it is. And, and it's, it, it, look at this, Jeff, they still spike. What are we talking about? What's going to happen on Thanksgiving? We found, yeah, out of 50 hours of Let It Be material, they're going to run, they, they couldn't boil it down to an hour. So it's going to be six hours of, of Beatles Let It Be sessions spread over three days where you're going to learn how they did what they did. And it's amazing from the clips I've seen. I can't wait. You know, just, just the whole creative process. Like the original Let It Be movie was horrible because they were breaking up. They did a couple of song videos, tacked the rooftop concert at the end. You see George and Paul arguing and it's like, oh my God, they're depressed. They hate each other. They hated the idea of having to go into the studio at 10 o'clock in the morning and make music. They were more like when they were inspired, they would do it. But then uh, when you see this movie, suddenly you see that well, they weren't miserable. They were really happy. Paul carries a picture of him and John sitting on two folding chairs, looking at music and smiling and laughing. And he's like, people tell me we hated each other. And I keep this to remind me that we didn't, that we really did love each other. And when you see this footage and you see, you know, you see just how much fun they're having, but they come up with a plot. Okay, we've got these, um, they hadn't toured in three years. So the idea was you've got three months to make a live album that we're going to premiere the entire album live. It never turned out that way, but that was the idea. And then you see them go in the studio and create the songs. And that's what's amazing because we see it 50 years later as what those songs became. They're in the studio as it's happening. And the, 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 the way they work together, like John's writing, great for comedy too. You know, John would write music and just say, just keep saying any words. Just say any words till you get the word. And how do you write comedy? Put in any line until you figure out the one mm -hmm. that's funny. Yeah, Rick Rubin, I just heard a great interview with him, how he was saying how he uh, just interviewed Paul McCartney and he was supposed okay. to have like an, an hour, I think it was like an hour they gave him, but he wound up doing like a six hour interview with McCartney and somebody asked him, you know, is there, you know, when you, to me, he's one of the most brilliant minds in music ever, you know, because he's crossed so many genres from rap to you rock. You want to go on country. a limb and say that, Sean? What's that? You want to yes. go on the limb and say that? Yes. He, he, he was pretty good. He's, he's a good, yeah, that, that's what's up. So he, uh, he's, he's, he's one of my favorite people on the planet, you know, and he's saying like, you're asking him like, you know, do you ever listen to the stuff that you produce? He goes, no, once it's produced, I never listen to it again. Like someone will say, Hey, we got a gold record. He's like, that's great. Blah, blah, blah. And they're like, you know, do you uh, listen to other people's music that you didn't produce and say, how would you tweak it? And he goes every single time he goes with the exception of the Beatles because the Beatles did not record one single bad note or word ever. And it's that's so true. Did you, that was the Hulu special, right? That became the Hulu. Yeah. You can see the interviews of Ruben on Hulu. Yeah. And yeah, you can't, how could you do an hour on the Beatles? I mean, you start talking. It's amazing that Paul's 79 years old. He's still got stories that we haven't heard of this band that was only together for six years. And here we are 50 years later, actually, and, and you know, anxiously awaiting something from the Beatles. Mm -hmm. They never got. No, how do you think, they, how came? do you think they would have been had John not died? Do you th I obviously think they would have gotten back together at some point. Probably but, like, probably live aid or yeah. was this that? And also I think that, um, my son's name Lennon. I'm a huge Lennon fan. Mm -hmm. And Larry Kane 
was a 21 year old reporter in Miami who in 1964 writes to Brian Epstein and says, I like the, he's a strict newsman and I'd like to cover the Beatles and do an interview. And Larry says, would you like to come on the tours with us? And next thing you know, 21 year old Larry is touring on three world tours with the Beatles and he gets close to John Lennon. And he said that if Lennon were alive today, he'd be all over the technology. He'd have his own podcast. He, his whole thing was, and Dennis Ferrante was an engineer on his early albums. And Dennis said, you know, he wanted to do an album a week. He wanted to do, he, he talked radio in perfect for him because he wanted to be in touch with his audience. He said that when they did Imagine, he wanted it at the WNAW studios by midnight so we could play the next day. He did Instant Calm. He woke up with it in his head. In an hour and a half, he had the song done. That, you know, they were used to working fast. The Beatles could turn out, think about this. They turned out four songs in an afternoon, mm -hmm. whereas they did the entire um, Please Please Me album in one day. Who does that? But there's, a great I, art, there's a great artist I love now, a country guy named Eric Church. Oh, yeah. And kind of different from like regular country. He's kind of like, a, I kind of put him in a different category. So during the quarantine, he rented out a... Uh, like a closed up restaurant in North Carolina because they were obviously closed during COVID. And he pumped out three albums in 27 days. There was 27, 27 songs on three albums. He wrote the song in the morning and recorded it at night. How was Every the day. What's that? How were the songs? You know, you would think that with 27 songs, you'd have a lot of shit. Right. Fantastic. Like they're Like that's when I realized this guy was good. But like, then you realize it's a different level of good. You know what I mean? Like this is the, this is where you go into the we go into the genius level. That's where you start going into the genius level. You know what I mean? But yeah, twenty seven songs in twenty seven days, and they're written and recorded all in one day. That when that you, blew my mind. Earlier in the show, Steve rattled off a bunch of Beatles albums, mm -hmm. and it, it's to me it's it's mind blowing that any band would kill just to have a white album. But then there's right. also Let It Be and Sgt. Pepper and Abbey Road. And I mean, it's it's it's, it's just amazing, like the depth of music that, that, you know, in such a short time, these guys put out. And I think even in their solo careers, you know, mm -hmm. uh, how much music you had. But you also kind of talked, touched on something about Lennon wanting, you know, would have been all, all the technology. And I think you saw hints of that because do you remember in the 70s, him and Yoko did like a week with them on the Mike Douglas show. Yeah, I have the DVDs. And right. he got the, he got to, that was a time when Lennon, you know, they had broken up. They were kind of insecure about what they were going to do. And Lennon's whole thing was about being for the people, being out in the crowd, being, you know, that's why he moved to New York. And that week with the Mike Douglas show, he got to play with Chuck Berry. He brought Bobby right. Seale on, you know, he had all the people that were influencing him. And at that point, he was, and that's daytime talk show, right? Exactly. He was on the Jerry Lewis Muscular Dystrophy Telethon uh, with Yoko singing "Give Peace a Chance." Did you watch that Dean Martin biop on a uh, documentary, "The King of Cool"? No. It was. It's on TCM Turner Movie Classic. I saw it last night. And there's another thing, like you know, the like Dean and the Rat Pack get into uh, like 1960. I interviewed, I forget the guy's name, but he wrote a book called Deconstructing the Rat Pack. And it was all about, you know, when you're coming at like the Rat Pack and where they fit in to the whole thing from like hmm. the, in 1960, uh, Las Vegas wanted to, they wanted to bring more money into Las Vegas. They go to Sinatra and he rents the Sands for 28 days. They do 28 shows in the entire month of February, two shows a day. They make Ocean's Eleven and the Rat Pack, but looking at it from, D. Martin's point of view, you know, this goes back to what we talking about the place in history. You have, when you look at where they were in their careers, like looking back, we're thinking, oh my God, the iconic Rat Pack, like the iconic Beatles. But at that time, Dean Martin was afraid. He just left Jerry Lewis. He doesn't know what he's going to do. And then he does that Young Lions. Sinatra, you know, his, his life was changing because he had gone from being this Bobby Soxer, then he's, you know, the 50s, you know, the, the movie guy. Now comes the 60s and he doesn't know what he's doing. You know, there, there's a lot of insecurity there. And they were like a boy band in the early 40s. And they knew, they, they knew where they were. They didn't know where they were going. But for this month, for this 1960, the Rat Pack is huge. And it's kind of like the same thing when the Beatles split up. It's like, okay, 
Lennon's like, all right, well, what are we going to do? You know, McCartney goes off to a farm and uh, puts a band together with his wife and starts knocking on college doors. Can we play tonight? Lennon and Yoko, they go out for peace. George comes out with three albums. Ringo's doing Sentimental Journey. There was um, a phone call that's in the book, um, Loving John by May Pang, where they were talking about the next Beatle album, which never took place. You know, what are we going to do for the next album? And think about what that album would have entailed. Right. Think about the songs that and you see them working on this in, uh, in in the get back that's coming up. But think about an album where the new Beatle album is going to have My Sweet Lord. It's going to have Give Feast a Chance. It's going to have Cold Turkey. It's going to have Maybe I'm Amazed. Uh, you know, it's going to have Another Day. And when you think about the solo work, that would have been the stuff that would have been on the Beatle albums. They wrote, John wrote Cold Turkey for the Beatles. Paul wrote, you know, uh, Maybe I'm Amazed. It was all for the Beatles. And when they took it to their own rights, to their own solo work, you know, think about what that would have been had they been Beatles albums. Think about how much better they could have been if Lennon and McCartney would have worked together on those songs. Yeah, you know, it's amazing. You know, what I always think amazing is about the Beatles is that you look at so many other bands, like uh, even say, like just say Zeppelin. Okay, Zeppelin's a great rock band, one of the greatest rock bands of all time. But when you put their solo stuff up against their back catalog, it's okay. Well, there's you know, not like, a lot of solo stuff with uh, Zeppelin. I, I think the I think the Robert Plant album is really good. Yeah, I mean, DePage did some stuff too. You know, with, yeah, with he other did the bands. firm and everything, but he yeah. never really had a, a. He needed Plant. When you look at the Beatles, though, like even Ringo, who you know, let's just call a spade a spade. He's the weakest of the four, right? And you're he was the most popular. Yeah, I mean, solo for, career. I didn't but, but but yeah, what I'm saying is like even like his solo career, like if you look at it. I mean, probably with the others. Kill for Ringo's solo. And out of the four of the solos, oh, God, probably right. number yeah. four. You know, like, it's, yes. it's, they're just the, such an amazing band that 50 years later, you know that 50 years from now, they are still going to be playing them as much as they are now. That's the material. And there'll still be a reason to buy something from the Beatles. I mean, yeah. every three years, like... Off the top of your head, and this is for both of you guys, off the yeah. top of your head, top five Beatles songs that you like. They don't have to be the best ones, but that, that you like. Hmm. Please, please. I will. Uh, take it to a ride. Uh, let me see if I got to go. If I got to go later. Oh, the entire Abbey Road medley. You know, the gold bombers medley. You got to put that in. All right. And uh, last but not least, uh, She Loves You. You know, those songs that you hear the first notes and you get chills. I'm going to go Don't Let Me Down. Mm. Uh, weird One, Ballad of John and Yoko. Uh, Helter Skelter, because I kind of feel that with Helter Skelter, kind of started heavy metal, in my opinion. Right. Uh Hmm. The last two are hard, though. I gotta tell you, I like the old. I like the older stuff. I'd probably go with uh, "Get Back," maybe, which is a little different. And then the last one I would pick would be uh, "Let It Be." Mm. How about, How about you? you? Uh, I think the one that always comes to mind first for me has always been um, "Wa Ma Guitar Gently Weeps." Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's that's a great one. Uh, I love um, uh, "Long and Wide." road i just think it's such a beautiful song and you know it holds up you know it always gets me um yeah I, I i may have to go with you on that on the uh golden slumber you know medley as well that's also fantastic um i do like the latest stuff as well you know i like i like everything off of let it be but uh i mean i'll even go something like strawberry fields i, I kind of like like the sounds in that as well and then for my last one, I mean, it's going to be a toss up between kind of like a sentimental guy, I guess. I kind of like In My Life and Fool on the Hill. In My Life is, is probably one of the greatest songs ever written. Yeah. No question. Yeah. But, but, but if you had to pick one album, what album do you pick? White album. Yeah, I do too. You know, That's kind of mine. My, my guitar gently weeps, Rocky Raccoon. I mean, there's so many great songs. You know what? I, I saw right before the pandemic, 
Um, you had Christopher Cross, Jason Schiff from Chicago, Todd Rudgren, and Mickey Dolenz, and the guy from I Bad Finger. What do you think about uh, that, Steve? That was the guy from Bad Finger was Joey Mullen. Uh, Joey Mullen. Jo- Joey Mullen? Mullen, M O L L A N D. That's right. That's right. Yeah, right. Joey okay. Mullen. I saw that at the Mayo Performing Arts Center. And it was great because they did a couple of their own. Mickey Dolan's was on that too. They did a couple of their own and then they would do a couple of Beatles songs. Christopher Cross, Do When I Will, was great. Um, Todd Rungren, I forget. I forget what songs they did, but it was like, we're going to do the White Album and they did two of their own. And it was a great show because you knew everything. And you, their interpretation of Beatles, but you also got what you came for. Todd Rungren did Saw the Light, Hello, It's Me. Uh, Christopher Cross did Ride Like the Wind. Uh, Joey Mullen did Baby Blue. And, and he I did the other, the, the other big uh, Bad Finger song. Uh, day After Day? No. Coming, uh, here it is, Coming no, Get It. Uh, no. No matter, no matter, no matter oh, what. No matter what. You, no matter what. You, yeah, right, yeah, right. That's the best Beatles song they never did. That's right. The Beatles. Uh, I gotta tell you, I was very lucky, very, very, actually very, I'll even say the word blessed, to go to the John Lennon 75th birthday concert. You went to at that? MSG, at MSG, yeah. And Jeff knows this story, but I'll give you a quick recap of it. And it, it happened once before, and it happened at this concert too. I made an ass out of myself at a Metallica concert by saying I was a famous comedian and I got upgraded <laughs> seats because of it. It <laughs> happened. At, it happened at the John Lennon concert too. I, I had really bad seats. It, it was in the theater downstairs at MSG, so it was kind of like it's a weird setup down there. I was like the third to last row, so I had like my mom and my wife with me. And then I went down. I saw a whole bunch of seats that were open, and I was like, "Hey, you know, is there a way to upgrade seats?" And a woman looked at me and she goes, "I know your face from somewhere." And I was like, "I don't. I'm don't know who you are." And she was like you sing? And I said, well, I used to, I said, but you would never see me ever sing. She goes, I know you, I know you. I said, well, I'm I'm a comedian. And she went, I did. I saw you. I saw you somewhere. And it was like like two years before upstate New York. And she had seen me and she gave me better seats. So we moved down to like, I think it was like 15th or 16th row right in front. And that was one of the most amazing shows I have ever been to in my entire life. I mean, the amount of stars. What's that? Was that Kevin Spacey hosting? Kevin Bacon. Oh, Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon Spacey. hosted it. But they had, I mean, seeing Willie Nelson do Imagine, you know, wow. and like some oh, of my wow. favorites, like like Chris Stapleton was, did Don't Let Me Down. I had chills going up my spine. You can still get the concert like on DVD, but just being there was unreal. But it was kind of weird because I had never been to like a taped concert before. So like Kevin would fuck up the lines and have to restart all over again. So the concert itself was like four hours long, but you put it on TV, it was an hour and a half. Have you guys ever had a chance to meet any of the Beatles? Uh, no. no. I got so far. I was supposed to interview Ringo last June for the uh, convention hall show he was going to do. And then came the pandemic. Closest I ever. I got to work with uh, McCartney a lot. Um, did you? Yes, and I'll tell you how. Um, do you remember in the early 90s he had come back and released an album called Flowers in the Dirt? Yeah, okay. So he's doing a press conference at the Belasco Theater, uh, on Broadway, and then had kind of, and I was listening to this on the radio that, that this was, was, was going to happen, he was going to announce his tour, and then he was going to kind of do an impromptu concert. And I happened to be in the city at the time. So I stopped by the theater to see if maybe I knew somebody who was working. Because at this time, I was still working, doing concerts. I go there. It's the guys I work with. And I go, hey, is there any chance that I can get in tonight? They're like, yeah, come by around 5 o'clock. We'll get you in. Okay? I, I go by. They're like, you know, and I'm wearing a shirt and tie. I, I may have been in the city for like an interview or something. I don't know why I was there. But I was, I was dressed nice. And they're like, hey, do you, you know, you dress nice. You want to work? You want to do the VIP area? I'm like, yeah, I'll, you know, I get to see the concert and get paid. I'm like, definitely. So now I'm, I'm on the second tier of this Broadway theater and I'm sitting next to Penny Marshall, but you also have uh, Axel Rose in the crowd and Raquel Welch and all, all these celebrities and, and, you know, musicians. And after the show, like, you know, what they do is they do a 
a sweep. So you would be at the front of the stage and, you know, just keep moving forward until every, you know, and go row by row until everybody leaves the theater. My friend Fred, who is Springsteen's road manager, like to, the, these, to this day, is up on the top where the dressing room is. And he's like, uh, he's like, do you want to work uh, up here? You know, we may have to stay another hour or so. I'm like, yeah, it's better than doing the sweep. So I go up and I'm, I'm, I'm in this little room that's like, this is like almost like this hallway vestibule area. And I'm again with um, Keith Richards is there and a couple of his side music. I was, I was hanging out talking to Paul, si uh, not Paul Simon, Paul Schaefer and Wadi Wachell, who is like the, uh, the guitar player, um, music director for Stevie Nicks. And I just hang him for about 45 minutes. McCartney comes out of his room, of the dressing room. First person he beelines to is me. Asks me um, my name, thanks me for staying and, and working, goes over to my friend Fred, then invites his guests back into the dressing room. Every time he would come to New York, whether it be doing Saturday Night Live or recording or coming for a, 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 an event or whatever it was, I always got the call to work uh, the hotel. And he would stay at the Plaza Athene. And this isn't like me and Sean staying at some Holiday Inn Express on the road. Okay. I mean, this was a duplex. This was an unbelievable uh, place where he would stay. And I, you know, would, would, would go there. And like when he would leave, you know, to go out, someone had to stay in the room who we trusted. And I don't know, maybe it just took a liking to me, but I always got that gig where I would be in the room. And you would just like circulating, just, you know, make sure no one was coming through a fire escape or broken but he would in his room he had that rickenbacker and i got to oh. pick it up and play the rickenbacker it was the first time i ever saw a phone in a bathroom and i called my dad to tell him hey i got paul mccartney's <laughs> file of facts here i got his rickenbacker i'm calling from his bathroom he couldn't have been nicer uh linda was a doll the only thing they asked you not to do is if you're going to bring food you know, uh, don't bring any meat. And if you needed food, you know, they, they hook you up with it. Um, it was unprofessional to ask for an autograph, but if you wanted one, you went through like their security guy and Paul would sign it. But you, you know, you just, you just didn't do it because you, you were working with them. So you didn't want to come off as a fanboy. So it was something I never, I never got the, an autograph, mm -hmm. but I got to meet with them. And it was always the arrangement until she died. And then they had the service at morning, uh, it was called Morningside Church, either Morningside or Morning View Church. And um, after that, he never stayed at the Plaza Athene again. And, you know, that was it. He, you know, it was just like a whole new crew. Am I the only one who's thinking, fuck this gig, I would steal that Rickenbacker and run <laughs> as fast as I possibly could? No, Sean, because you, you know what? It would have been like a selfish dick move to do. Plus, you also would have never, never worked any other gigs again you would have been I'd be fine person. with that i'd totally be fine with that <laughs> having oh, balls right. you know, he won't me. take pictures i heard yeah it a lot of people don't do them now yeah. axel axel won't sign autographs anymore he goes why am i going to sign something that's going to go on ebay and it's hey, the truth. Well, he's, i'll talk to you uh you know i'll talk to you i'll spend time with you but i'm not taking a picture i'm not signing anything eddie vetter's the same Floyd way won't take pictures. i know he's weird well, too yeah. well, he's a big deal he is a big deal. Yeah, no, he was in Good Morning Vietnam. But uh, Eddie Vedder does the same thing too. Eddie Vedder oh, will I'm actually. I about yeah. it. <laughs> now, Eddie will. Eddie won't take pictures no, either. Floyd he just wants to hang and talk, which is I think I think that's actually better. Would you rather have a picture that you're going to show yeah. to everybody? Oh, look how cool I am! Or would you rather have five okay. minutes with Eddie Vedder's undivided attention? Five minutes. Exactly. Man. You'll have that forever. Did you do you know what uh, Gene Simmons does with the vault? Have you heard about that? Because I covered that. Gene Simmons put out a box set, and it, it's a it's a vault. It comes with a thirty. It's a, it comes in a thirty eight pound safe, and you open it's two thousand dollars, and you open up the safe, and it's Gene Simmons box set. His memorabilia, whatever he wants to give you, his, his discs, whatever is in this vault. Part of the deal is he does a tour. And he comes, when he came to Philadelphia, he played the Trocadero. So, now this is great. Uh, I was covering it for the press. So I get invited to go down there. And the people who paid the money were upset. You know, what are these guys getting in before we get in? So we go upstairs. They've got 
upstairs in the balcony of the Trocadero. He's got 200 people at 2,000 bucks a head. He's got sliders, uh, pigs in blankets, open bar, and you get the party. And Gene goes up on stage and he does a bit. And he, you know, he performs for the crowd. And he shows how like different songs run into other songs and stuff like that. So in the middle of this, right, I, I'm covering this for the radio station, 101.5. I got my iPhone out. I am like about 10 feet away. I am recording this. And in the middle of the recording, doesn't the phone ring? And he looks at me and says, oh, I'll get that. And he starts breaking my balls from the stage. And um, turns out the guy calling me was Johnny Lombardi, Gemini. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? I'm trying to get the phone off. And you're like, you're trying to get the phone off. And now the phone won't turn off because yeah. you have forgotten to turn the phone off. And it keeps ringing and ringing. So now he's breaking my balls from the stage. And, um, you know, but getting back to it, though, uh, part of the deal is you get to go in a room like Gene performs when he's done performing. He goes in the room and he sits there uh, alone. And one by one, you get to go in and have five minutes alone with Gene Simmons. And you could ask him anything you want and he'll talk to you. And that's part of the deal. And uh, to think about, think about this, 200 people at $2,000 a head just yeah. in that effort. And he was touring the country doing this. Uh, so I tell him, I tell Gemini, I'm like, son of a bitch, you know what you did? He goes, why didn't you, why didn't you just tell him it was Paul's family? I say, yeah. Why didn't I think? You don't think of anything like that. But yeah, but Gene Simmons will do your wedding for $50,000. Oh, but yeah. he's talking about, he's on stage and he's playing. And he's talking about songs that run into other songs and where they came from. And he, he does, he's talking about uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And he goes, uh, you know, like, way up on the lemon drops, that, 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 words are flowing out like endless, that, 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 that. And then it becomes the theme from Jaws. But those same, and you get those three completely different songs. And he's talking about how, because he loved the Beatles, and the Beatles the greatest band ever. And John Lennon knew how to draw from other songs. And he starts with Across the Universe. And then from there, he goes to Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And from there, he goes to Jaws. And there's some kind of a thing where uh, there's like 4,000 songs that all sound alike. And like they're, they're like, you can find them on YouTube where just riffs that run into other riffs that become other songs. Listen, um, what's the, it's Hair of a Dog by Nazareth and right. Day Tripper are the exact same yeah. riff. Oh yeah, I can note see for that. Note. No for note, no, it's yeah, note yeah, I for note. That. Yeah, I never I thought didn't of know. that before. <laughs> Well, how Crazy. about the baseline of 25624 and uh, oh my uh God, you're no, and, and well, and I was gonna say the Zeppelin song, uh, Babe, I'm gonna leave you, boom, 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 yeah, boom, 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 boom. right, yeah, it's exactly also same while my God gently weeps, yeah, it's in it's, there, it, it's amazing, Steve. This hour went by unbelievably quick, it's an hour already, it's been over an hour. Oh my god! Right, and and yeah, the thing is, we're fun. just getting started, <laughs> and we actually we, talked about music for a change, which is great. Yeah, well, like it's nice. It's nice when you have someone who like is yeah, you know, who knows their shit, unbelievably knowledgeable, and and we're just tipping the iceberg. But you know, we you know, I know it's Sunday, and you know, the games are going to start shortly. So um, I, I can't thank you enough, man. You know, for coming down and just like you know, spending a little time with us on a Sunday morning. Yeah, thanks for having me. This has Absolutely. been a lot of. All right, folks. Sean, do, do you, did you want to ask a, you know, a parting question? Um, yeah, who's your, who is it? your favorite person, uh, for favorite co-host on this podcast? Was it me or Jeff? My favorite co is that I'm going to save that as a tease for the next interview, for the next oh, podcast. That's a radio guy right there. <laughs> Yo, I that's learned. a fucking radio guy. I like it. <laughs> hey, happy hey, buddy. You too, buddy. We'll talk to you Thank soon. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, Sean, and we'll catch you next time on Who's Your Band. We'll be back next week with another great show. Take care, everybody. Subscribe. Later.